Hello, and welcome to Young at Harp. I am Deborah Henson Conant, and this is Kathleen Wiley, and we are going to talk today about the visions of the heart. Um, Jung at Harp is a conversation between Kathleen and me. Kathleen is a Jungian psychoanalyst. I am a composer and a performer. We both play the harp, thus Jung at Harp. And uh, we started a conversation a few years ago in a car that was so wonderful that um, I asked if we could continue that conversation here. And so today we are talking about the vision of the heart. Now, this happened because beforehand we started talking about things and first we were going to talk about this and I was like, yes, yeah, so we want to talk about containers of vision and then you talked about the chambers of the heart and eventually you were like, let's just stop here for a second. You're scattered today, right? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's me. And so um, we're putting those together. So Kathleen, I am going to hand it over to you because I know I'm going to be fascinated with whatever we talk about. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, years ago, I did a, a training program with Angelus Arian, who was a cultural anthropologist who studied indigenous cultures around the world and gleaned universal spiritual truths. And one of the meditations I learned from her is called the four chambered heart meditation. And when we started talking about Valentine's Day and sending musical valentines and expressing love. And then we started talking about how do we move into our whole self and the importance of working with someone who has a larger vision for us. Then I want us to offer today to ourselves as a reminder to everyone who's listening, the vision of the four chambered heart, where we really move through our life with a sense of where are we open hearted? And where are we closed hearted? And we're going to come back and talk about all of these. Where are we full hearted? And where are we half hearted? And where are we strong hearted? And where are we weak hearted? And where are we clear hearted? And where are we confused hearted? <laughs> because when we think about vision and implementing a vision, which more often than not in our Western world gets talked about as goals, having goals to me. Um, and I think about goals as more the specific, this is, this is the roadmap, these are the turns I'm gonna take, but I think the intention is the vision. It's the bigger picture of where we're going. And sometimes the picture we have with our ego of where we're going it's way too limited and too small. And we don't know it because if you're in a box and that's all you know, you may not even know you're in a box. Yeah. So this four chambered heart meditation, I think it's a way for us to assess where we're in the box, where we have a big enough vision because where we're full hearted, whole hearted, clear hearted and strong hearted there is vision. There is vision that's beyond the limitations of one small container. Can you talk a little bit about that? So there's four different, four different chambers, and you said there's vision in each of the chambers. Is that, is that what you said? Well, I think they come together to create vision that is the largesse of our soul. <clears throat> when you say that, I think of a fly and having all these different eyes. And I also think of us as having two eyes. And so I'm thinking that with, if, if each chamber of the heart or each, um, and, and okay, so, so there's so much about vision. There's, you know, there's fuzzy vision. There's being able to see far. There's being able to see close. There's the, the amazing capability that we have to refocus and then literally see what's there and not there. I mean, this is making me think about my friend, Nat Durlach, who was a, um, who worked in the um, media at MIT in the audio lab. And we talked a lot about um, the ability of the ears to focus on things, to pull things out of cacophony. And he was really fascinated with this idea because it's not an, it's not, it has nothing to do, nothing changes, 
but we can pull something out of cacophony. And I'm thinking about this uh, now when you're talking about vision, that we have that capacity with our ears and with our eyes to refocus on specifics. And um, and then now you're talking about the four chambered hearts and I'm thinking, and I got it like, oh, and that may be four different ways of vision or four different focuses. And if we pull them all together, what happens? Because we, when we have stereo audio and when we have stereo video, we see distance and we see our relationship to things. Yeah, what you're saying, I'm following. So it's like if we had these four eyes, but they're all going in different directions, instead of moving in concert, we end up scattered. But when we can in any given moment in time, all four eyes are working in harmony. All four eyes, so to speak, are in sync with the same focus. Then all of our energy comes to bear like the power of a laser beam. This is making me think of music and it's making me think of the roles in music. Um, although I think it's slightly different, but, but certainly um, when we're playing music, we have a melody. And we hear that melody as a line. And we hear the bass as a line. And we have harmony in the middle. But if we can. Then, then I, I don't know what I don't have a conclusion to that. What is the I mean, I just see that they all become one thing and it's a different, it's different. Yeah, it, I'm thinking about the principle of, um, where the sum is greater than the total of the parts. Isn't that the mathematical principle? Right, right. Yeah, that when you put those three together, what's created is far bigger than any one piece individually. But each individual piece and the vision for each individual piece is an important step and the creation of the whole. Well, I just thought about something. With, I've heard that phrase so many times and I realized that what is bigger is the resonance. Mm -hmm. Both the, the resonance that we hear and also somehow our engagement with it. I, I don't really know what, 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 what gets bigger because, because I never asked that question. I just accepted that thing. Um, okay, so, but certainly richer. Well, Richard, and I'm going to say, I, I think what gets bigger is consciousness, ah. and our conscious experience. You know, when you play the bass line, I have one experience in my body. When you play the melody, I have another in another area of my body. Mm -hmm. And when you play the harmony, I have another place in my body. I feel it. You put the three together. And it's not just that they're all firing off randomly, but there's something that they create together that's a different experience. And I think as you're talking about that, I think that part of what's beautiful about that is it is a metaphor for human connection. Yes. And, and it's an example of where when we're moving in a direction that we're full hearted about, open hearted to possibilities, strong hearted and clear hearted, we have one experience, but when we're moving in a place where we're full hearted, but we're weak hearted, <laughs> that's another experience. Wow. And now, that, now, you're, now you're making me think of a color wheel. because <laughs> So this is really interesting. Um, I just want to bring it into context with we're, we're recording this right before Valentine's Day or about a, a week and a half before Valentine's Day. And, um, and I'm doing two there's two things I'm doing and, and this is really resonating with me with both of them. So one of them is that I, I have a bee in my bonnet about this um, making video Valentines. And um, it's, it's, a, it's just a way of putting together music and words and, and, and individual videos for people. And the reason that I, I mean, I've, I've, I've felt passionate about this for a couple of years and I got really passionate about it last year. And I sent video Valentines to the people in my, in my life who I love. And 
and one of them was my sort of my impromptu foster mother, the person who took me in when I left home really early. And um, I just sent her this video Valentine, just telling her what I what I love about her. And I have kind of a blueprint for it, so it's, it's so I can put the thing together and just really focus on on telling somebody how I, much I love them. And um, she didn't get it at first, and then I, I texted her and said, you know, I sent you this thing, can you look at it? And she looked at it and and then just sent me this beautiful text, and I. It, it was the beginning of a of, of a year where we spent a lot of time talking on the phone, and I learned a lot about her and her life, and you know things that anyway it was a, it was a beautiful year with her from a distance, and um, and she died a week and a half ago, and so I won't be sending her a Valentine this year, and and I'm I will never get back the time that I had. I will never I will never be able to call her and ask her. You know what was it like uh, the day World War II ended? You know, or like I will never be able to ask her those things again. But I know, I know that she knows that I love her because I was able to take this simple blueprint, and I was willing to. And I'm interested whether I was full hearted or, you know, if I was all those things and send that to her and connect with her. And just knowing that we had that connection makes a huge difference for me. And so I'm thinking when you're talking about this full hearted and all of this, that this is such an important way to be in the world so that we can feel like I, I did do, I did Maybe I didn't do everything that I could have possibly done, but I know that you know that I love you. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about moving something that you feel in here to out here in the field between you and the person. And, you know, <laughs> you know, they always say no one lays on their deathbed and says, oh, I wish I'd worked more. Yeah, but you know, people say things like, you know, I wish I'm going to say that. I think I will. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think I'll, people tend more to say things like, I wish I'd spent more time with my family, or I wish I'd let so and so know how much they meant to me, or how much I love them. So, what you're talking about is slowing down enough with our own inner stuff, which can consume us all <laughs> our inner stuff, to say, you know, I really want to reach out, and and it's like a thread that the, the musical Valentine card between you and your, um, your adoptive mother was like a thread that became a circuit that communication began to occur again. And something very meaningful and rich for you and for her happened. And it, I, I'm guessing it solidified something internal in you that she gave you. You know, it, it's, that's really interesting, Kathleen, because as you're speaking about this, I realized that uh, in, many, in many ways I didn't feel that I had the right to love her or, or have the relationship to her that I had. And making this Valentine really... Um, it, it 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 kind of gave me permission to let her to 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 have that to to belong to that love that that love belonged to me that our relationship belonged to me and that I was declaring it and that I was declaring it with every single part of me and and when I think back on you know what what made that happen what allowed that you know it, one of one of the things was I made a blueprint. Uh -huh. A very simple blueprint about how to do this so that I didn't have to, so that I wasn't sitting there and thinking, how can I make this incredible thing to let her know? It was like, no, it's simple. You step one, step two, step three, and then let the spirit flow. So there was that simple blueprint. And that's another thing I'm working on right now. Blueprints for creativity mm -hmm. so that we're not fussing with the form, mm -hmm. that we're really allowing the form to support us. So that was one thing. Another thing was allowing myself to kind of take back technology. So YouTube, it's very easy to fall into the like, I'm, well, how many hits do I have? Blah, 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 blah. And I took it back and said, this is a video for a single person. Mm -hmm. One, the most important person 
to see this video. And so taking back technology in that way and owning it, and not that YouTube ever said you can't do this, but I mean, I had, right. that was another deep part of this. So having the blueprint, having the, being willing to be like, okay, you might write back and say, no, how dare you claim that we have a relationship? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, but really claiming, claiming my side, I love you. And it's kind of like claiming being a composer, good or bad, it doesn't matter, this is who I am. Or kind of like when I started claiming my voice as a singer, not as a singer, but as singing as being an important part of my work. It's just like, that's what I have to do, whether my voice is good or whether my voice is bad, that is irrelevant. Singing is my voice and loving this person is, that is my truth. And so, sorry, I'm just going on about this, you know, stating my truth. And I, I always hated Valentine's Day because it was like, if you had a boyfriend and you weren't, you know, going out somewhere, you were being a bad girlfriend. If you didn't have a boyfriend, then you were a loser. And then something happened last year where I took it back. I was like, no, this is just an opportunity to share love and I'm going to do it. So Kathleen, please talk and stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I think THC, what you're, what you're sharing is how you moved into being more full hearted. Okay. And that by claiming your love for your um, adoptive mother, um, then you were claiming a part of your own heart and soul. And so you were becoming more full hearted and you were strong hearted. And you said, I'm going to send this whether she rejects it or not. <laughs> you know? And you were clear hearted with your blueprint, you know, and you were open hearted and that you were willing to let spirit, your spirit of love flow. So I think you're giving us an example of where you all four of those chambers were working together and the overarching vision actually ended up being something it created something you didn't even imagine you and she began to have regular phone contact and really got to know each other now so that what you had at that time in your life, which I'm imagining was your late teens. I don't know if that's the right time. And I'm, I, I got to say, we had been in touch before then, but that opened that opened it up even more. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So my late teens was when I was living with her. Yeah. So my guess is it allowed you to reconnect with something very important that, sh that you experienced then that might have gone dormant. Yeah, and and that's really interesting because I've been visiting her and seeing her a lot, you know, since like in the past five, ten years, a lot. Um, but the something about the Valentine, it, there was something about the public, even though it was private, declaration of owning this love, of having a right to this love. I mean, I think, I think that's part of it. Yeah. Wait, you know, we've been talking about vulnerability. You were vulnerable and your open heartedness. You didn't, you weren't hiding it anymore. You weren't concealing it. You, and, and that really is the heart of being vulnerable is that we just stand with all of who we are and here it is. You know, there's a wonderful statement and my defenselessness, my safety loss. And it's talking oh, about say it, say it again in my yeah, in my defenselessness, my safety laws. Where that is that you from? were you were not defended at all with your Valentine, and you were safe because you were expressing something in you that just is. It just is, and it, it anyone's reaction to it wasn't going to change it. Now let's. Let, now Sylvia was completely loving, and I actually blogged about this today, and I and I shared that Valentine, I shared that video, in my blog, um, which was also scary. But let's say somebody does this, so I'm encouraging everybody to do this. 
mm-hmm. whether they play the harp or you know whatever they play and and that's part and these these we- I'm doing one on Sunday and and one and again next week to just kind of show people give them the, that blueprint which is really simple it's just like five things but what what if I mean I want to go back to the full hearted uh, mm-hmm. that as well and but what if somebody is snide or what if somebody doesn't respond but especially what if somebody's snide like what if you send if i encourage people to do this and then they're slammed down because the person who receives it doesn't receive it in love i mean i hear i hear all the time i I mean i'm i ask my students to do these forms all the time and i hear that it change you know it opens them up and but what if it doesn't what if there's somebody who's perfectionistic and it was like "Eh, I, i couldn't i Oh yeah, thanks, but I couldn't see you very well. Or, or oh, thanks, but you know you're a little out of tune. You might want to work on that. Or like, what? what how? How? You strike them off of your Valentine's card list for next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I. You know, I think DHC. What you're talking about, it. You know, is something that we often circle around too, which is so important for us to remember. Is that someone else's reaction to us? really tells us more about them than it does about us. I know that, (laughs) but it still hurts. Yeah, well, it still hurts. And there's a place where we also have to learn how to let those things bounce off and not take them in as truths about us. And the reason they hurt is because some part of us believes them. That's really what we, so if you get a snug comment back and you feel devastated, then it's an invitation. Where is that part of me that's sniper shooting me and constantly devastating me? And oh, maybe that's why I'm a little depressed. Or maybe that's why I can't really let myself do this project I want to do. Or maybe that's why I can't consistently get at my practice with the heart. So how would somebody find that? Let's let's bec- so let's say you send something out and the reaction it, it's probably not going to be a direct hit. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're not going to be able to see it directly. It's probably going to be something that's you know that's been around in your life for a long time and it's a it's a it's something that's been hurting for a long time. Mm-hmm. How can you look for it and then start addressing it? without just like caving into the like, oh, God, there was that arrow. And I, we've talked about the two arrows before that, you know, I think we have about the first arrow that, um, you know, where, where we get wounded and then the other arrow we put in as we hit ourselves that we shouldn't be wounded or whatever it is. But how, yeah, do, we well, see, I mean, how yeah. do we see that? Do we, can we scan our body? Is there a way to separate or scan, you know, to, for the pain? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so when you said scan, I was thinking one thing, but you okay. said scan. Okay, well, both, yeah. Usually we know we're hurt because we feel it in our body. Somewhere there's a physical sensation of pain. So what you can do is sit down, do some deep breathing to get yourself centered in the moment, and then begin to talk to that pain, that place. Let's just say it feels like an arrow in your heart and begin to talk to that arrow and say, okay, what is it you're really trying to tell me? What's going on here? And heart, what do you need from me now to not hurt? Dialoguing with the body sensation where we experience the pain, tracking our self-talk where we're reinforcing the negative comment, you can have a dialogue with that part of you, that voice inside that keeps saying, see, she's right. You were out of tune. You should have never said that. Right. Doing a dialogue with that voice and saying, tell me, tell me why you're here. Why are you harassing me? I mean, you know, we have, we do active imagination all the time. I mean, in our it just happens spontaneously. <laughs> right? A part of me wants to get up at 5.30 and do my stretches and some meditation. And I wake up and then another part of me is laying in bed and oh, but God, I want to stay in bed this morning. And then this other part, I mean, but what we do in active imagination is we focus it. And with it, and again, the act of the dialogue is what's important. It's not what's said. It's not even what you think changes in the moment. 
but it's the being in relationship to that begins to shift something. Because really all we need, I say all, what we need is just a subtle shift from like, yeah, that hurt, but you know what? It's not the whole truth. And yeah, maybe that little phrase was out of tune and, you know, okay, maybe I need to change the strings of that octave and, and you know what? I'm just glad I, uh, we, we begin to relativize it instead of it being the absolute truth. Okay, so this reminds me of something we've talked about before, which is when you said relativize it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, right, I'm always looking for these three things, awareness, process, relationship. Mm -hmm. So the awareness is I'm hurt. And it sounds like you're saying we can often feel it. I often notice it because of the compensa compensation I start for. It's like... Time for a fudge bar, you know, yeah. and I'm like, okay, oh, wait, right. That means I just got hurt or. Uh, yeah. So look, it's so, so knowing, tracking and knowing your own defensive behaviors, like what do we do to defend against fe our feelings, particularly the painful feelings, but we also can defend against joy. I mean, it's, it, it's not just the, um, quote, negative, unquote, or the unpleasant feelings that we defend against, we can defend against joy and relaxation and pleasure. That sounds like a big subject I'd like to go <laughs> into sometime. Okay, so let, but let's track back because we're talking about we're talking about expressing ourselves as we often do. We're talking about the four chambers of the heart, which I really want to talk about because I think they're going to be very meaningful to help people as they go into this Valentine's Day in lo lockdown or in, in disconnect, um, which is just an excuse or another opportunity to actually, you know, be able to share love in a way that may be more, a little bit more safe because it's Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we're, we're talking about, and we're talking about how to kind of prepare ourselves if our love is not embraced. And now let's talk about, and, 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 and I just want to say, so what you've said is become aware. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to see where we've been afraid of this all our lives. And maybe this is, this will help us. Maybe this is why we have not been more forthcoming or more yeah, with our love. And so it, Valentine's day is another opportunity to look at that. And you've given us some ways to do that. And so now let's go back and I'm, so you've given us ways to deal with, okay, when it goes sour, do this <laughs> and, and see it as a good thing. I have a blueprint, you know, and I'm sharing that in the next co a couple of weeks in these free webinars, which I'll put a link in along with this. Um, now let's go back to what you first started talking about, which is being full hearted, you know, all those things. Can you talk about that? So this, I believe this, what you're about to talk about is how to become aware of ourselves and how to engage when we are expressing love. Am I right? Is that? When we're expressing love, when we're being creative, when we're going about our work day, because part of what makes the difference in any interaction, whether it's our engagement together here or it's um, with a Valentine card that we create and send to someone, is whether or not we show up full-hearted, open-hearted, clear-hearted, that connection is what we want, and strong-hearted. Because when we, when we show up with those four chambers, then we have a presence where something happens. It's like, sometimes, you know, I use the analogy, we come together and it's like, potluck you know you bring a little bit of this i bring a little bit of that and then we see what happens you know right right um and i also think and i want to say we need to be able to acknowledge where we are half-hearted where we're weak-hearted and let me back up and say acknowledge without judgment of ourselves but just to see for information wow I'm kind of weak hearted about that person, even though my head is telling me I love them. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm really not strong hearted here in my desire to send them a card. I'm, I'm kind of weak hearted there. 
And we need to be able to say, see where we're half-hearted, that, oh yeah, I really like this person, but, you know, that we're not full-hearted. And, our, and, and the same again is true of our own, um, our own day, you know, like my getting up early in the morning for meditation and creative time, or, you know, am I really full hearted about cooking this meal or am I half hearted and resentful? I mean, it makes a difference. Well, let me ask you something. Let's, I know we're, we're coming to the end. Um, so let's say somebody's going to make a Valentine for someone else, whether they're drawing it or whether they're making a video or whatever they're making, or whether they're just saying something. Could you give an example of how to know if you're coming to it full hearted or half hearted? Like if you imagine you're sitting down, you're going to play your harp and you're going to make a Valentine. Um, an example of wh how you'd know if you're full or half-hearted and what to do if you notice that you're half-hearted or close-hearted or fuzzy-hearted or weak-hearted. Yeah, so in, in Cliff Notes, and we'll do part two next week, <laughs> <laughs> the Cliff Notes is that the first thing you have to do is acknowledge it without judgment. It's not right, you're wrong. It just is. And then the second thing you have to do is look at, okay, what's this telling me? If I'm half-hearted about this, what information is that pointing me to see? What experience with this person might be lingering in the background creating the half-heartedness or the weak-heartedness or the closed-heartedness? So we have to acknowledge without judgment that it's there and then we have to look again, dialogue, and say, "What are what is this? What are you telling me? What is it you want to make sure I know and consciously know?" And then in that dialogue, you you can see what happens next. You know, for instance, sometimes if I'm feeling resentful at the end of the day, that here I am in the kitchen cooking. And I can realize, okay, I'm half-hearted about this, which usually means some resentment's going to be following. <laughs> then I can check and say, okay, wait a minute. Do I want to be doing this or not? There are lots of other options here. You know, we can get takeouts from two minutes down the road. We, what do I really want? And it allows me to identify where is the half-hearted or weak-heartedness rooted? Well, maybe it's just rooted in, I didn't give myself a break between my last client and going straight to the kitchen. And what I need is to sit down for 20 minutes at my heart, or I need to go outside and walk my dog, you know? Um, or maybe it's telling me, I really want to be waited on tonight. And so I am going to call and get takeouts. I don't want to know, you know, what's it telling me? And so I think that when we honor that being half-hearted, weak-hearted, confused-hearted, um, or closed-hearted isn't bad or wrong, it's just information. And it then allows us to get that information about ourselves and our own experience consciously, and by bringing it into consciousness, something begins to shift. So that's that first step you always talk about is awareness, right. awareness. Yeah. And oh boy, I have so many questions and I know, I know it's our time is coming to um, a close for today. So some of the things I would be interested to know is how can we see half heartedness in ourselves? How can we see closed heartedness in ourselves? How can we see confused heartedness and weak heartedness in ourselves? Do you want to give us a hint to work on for the week? Yeah, my hint would be to pay attention to where you feel resistance, or you get lethargic, or you have difficulty focusing, or you sabotage yourself, or you fall prey to distractions, even though you're saying, I want to do this. Those are all indicators that one of those chambers is telling you something is not in alignment. And you talked about tracking that. You talked about track. You said the word tracking, and I realized tracking equals awareness, or that's one way to get awareness. So we can actually look at that. So we can actually use the experience of starting to create and prepare our Valentines to help us see where we're half hearted, closed hearted, confused hearted, or weak hearted. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, 
this is great because we still have, you know, nine days <laughs> before Valentine's Day. And not that we have to stop after that. That can be the beginning of a year of the expression of love. But this is a great opportunity for us to start becoming aware of that in ourselves. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. This was, as always, a total pleasure. It was great. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good. I'm going to stop the video. Thank you for everybody for listening. We'll see you next week. And I'm stopping 